Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us for Put a Beer on It, Brownfields to Brewfields Redevelopment. My name is Erica Rippey, and I'm the Program Manager at the Center for Creative Land Recycling. So just before we dive into our webinar, I just want to go over some housekeeping points. If you go uh, to the console on the right, you'll be able to download the presentation so you can follow along. A webinar or the recording of the webinar will also be available on our website at that address. And in the follow-up email, you'll also get a link to the recording. We will also be answering questions at the end of the webinar, so please type in any questions you might have and we'll get to it at the end. Uh, in the follow-up email, we'll also send a survey, so if you could please respond to that survey to help, uh, to help keep our programming fresh, that would be great. So a little bit about the Center for Creative Land Recycling. We are an EPA technical assistance to Brownfield's communities grantee, and we put on many workshops and webinars like this one, like this one today. We do policy and research, and we also do grant review as well. So visit us online at www.cclear.org, and uh, our contact information will be listed at the end of this webinar. So get in touch if you have any questions about our services. So a little bit about today's speakers. We have Mead Anderson, who is the Brownfield Program Manager, calling in from Virginia. And uh, he's going to give, he's going to start us off with a big overview of brownfields and the catalyzing effects that brewfields have on communities. Sarah Fraser is calling in from uh, North Carolina with New Belgium Brewing. And she's going to be talking a little bit about, uh, about Asheville, the Asheville Brewery. We have Dave McCormack from Wa Waukesha Development. And he's going to be talking about a few rural breweries in Virginia as well. Steve Gill, who's the Brownfields Program Manager, is calling in from Idaho, and he's going to talk about uh, some of the state programs that he's worked with. So, I, Mead, I'm passing it off to you, and take it away. Thank you, Erica. Uh, Mead Anderson in Virginia, and uh, appreciate everybody joining us today. Next slide. Uh, you know, so you're looking down the black hole of, of brew fields and you're trying to figure out where to go and what to do. But first, I'd like to give you just a little bit of background on brown fields. And, and I always like to start with the definition of brown fields, <clears throat> which is um, the real property expansion, redevelopment, or reuse of a, of a property that may be hindered or, or impeded by uh, contamination uh, that could be present. And that's the uh, Virginia definition, but the definition is pretty much the same across uh, the US. And just keep in mind, not all brownfields are cr created equal. There are some that are, I like to call light brown, and there's some real dark brown ones, and there's some tan fields that are pretty easy to manage. So it, we're gonna get into all this in a little bit. Uh, one thing I do like to point out uh, it, that Virginia does have is a brownfields policy and uh, the Department of Environmental Quality as well as our uh, economic development partnership are supposed to be working together to find solutions for these sites out there. Uh, somewhat unique in Virginia to have that policy, but we, we like to hold it up and, and say we're here to help. We're the government. <laughs> anyway. Um, our question has been, is, uh, is beer the cat, uh, revitalization catalyst? It, you know, if we'd only known that, that uh, next slide, that beer was the elixir of redevelopment. Um, and, and one thing that we've noticed in Virginia is that some of these small rural breweries that we're going to talk about are, are really uh, changing the scene in some of these uh, challenged communities. Um, and I don't want to take anything away from the New Belgians and the Stones that we have, um, but there's only so many top 10 brewers out there, and, and they're great uh, partners. You're going to hear a lot of really good stuff about New Belgian in just a few minutes. But there's some, some 
wonderful small brewers that are revitalizing towns and there's a, a lot of property a lot of inventory of old buildings out there that, that can be used uh, you have to keep in mind the the larger the brewery the longer the lead time on redevelopment um, and uh, you know these folks are urban pioneers and they're moving into these small towns and are making quite a bit of difference and almost all these sites are brownfields just a quick slide to show you the distribution across Virginia and where you see a number, that means there's more than one uh, brewery, needless to say, but there's a lot of single uh, brew type pubs out in uh, very rural areas. <coughs> Next slide. Uh, you know, I think that what we're seeing is a new age of stewardship uh, of, of these properties. And you're gonna see a lot of it revitalizing brownfields, adaptive reuse, reclaim materials, uh, energy efficiency, alternative energy. We're seeing solar out there powering some of these things, reducing the waste, better stormwater management on these sites and conservation landscaping practices and native free planting. So that's all coming. Um, and there's a lot of results that happen beyond uh, the footprint. Uh, big support of local organizations, uh, more breweries joining in in the area. Jobs, restaurants, food trucks in particular have been really important in Virginia. Uh, it's a whole new niche business, a community involvement, greenways connecting with, with some of these different breweries. And the results have been, you know, that these breweries have been cornerstones to neighborhood revitalization, craft beer trails, events, um, a lot of interest of other businesses joining in and moving into these areas. We've seen this in Richmond where we're actually having Fortune 500 companies move into these areas that were somewhat abandoned. Um, there's a number of different programs out there in, in the state and on the federal level, and there's tools available for buying these properties. You should make sure that you use them. And the programs such as the Brownfields program are there to facilitate property reuse. Uh, they're quite a bit different than many of the models that we've used in the past in regulatory programs. Um, a quick uh, net policies is a, it just, we have got a voluntary cleanup program in Brownfields laws like many other states. But one thing to keep in mind, uh, Virginia has a memorandum of agreement with EPA for when you complete a voluntary cleanup. That's an important uh, point out there. Um, and, and other states have MOAs too. Not every state does. Uh, one, let's see, next slide. On the federal side of things, and I'm not going to get into to all the different uh, ASTM standards, but one thing I do want to point out is that if you're looking at EPA money, you need to do an ASTM evaluation of uh, the site for the phase one and the phase two, if necessary. Otherwise, you could uh, uh, possibly bar yourself from getting an EPA grant down the road. So please do those phase ones and phase two to work and look closely at them. And one of the problems that, that we've had is that sometimes the results are a little bit too good to believe and it gets people in trouble down the road. Um, I want to mention the new Build Act. Um, that was just uh, passed by Congress in March 23rd. And once again, I'm not going to get into all of this, but it expanded the eligibility of nonprofit organizations to get grants. Uh, it's helped out with publicly owned properties that towns, municipalities, counties have had to uh, acquire in different ways. Increased funding of remediation grants and multipurpose grants. And these are all important changes that uh, is probably do a whole webinar in itself. Uh, in Virginia, we offer a couple of different type of comfort letters to help people out buying and selling their property. Uh, and we also have the voluntary remediation program that is there to, for when you have the darker brown brownfields or when you need to eliminate liabilities out there. Uh, it's a good program uh, and uh, We've taken quite a few sites through it. Um, once again, back to the Brownfields programs are designed for uh, to facilitate property reuse. Many sites just have lead and asbestos contamination. However, a lot of them do have more uh, a need for more active cleanup with a greater regulatory involvement. Much of this gets back to the risk tolerance of the developers. 
a uh, matter of economics. It's going to cost more to, to do more cleanup, but sometimes it's necessary to maintain the protect, uh, protections that are in the statues themselves and also to make the sites protective for reuse. Um, you need to look closely at your development time frames and, and how you're going to do cleanup out there. Sometimes it's location and location and location. Uh, which is too good to pass up. So you want to clean it up. And often the wild card is the amount of time it's going to take to get through the environmental cleanup. On funding sources, there, there are some state grants out there. Search closely for these grants, tax credits, different things. Uh, I, you're going to hear some of this, I know from Dave, on historical tax credits, different grants, alternative funding, and that type of thing. Um, one thing I'll mention is EPA does have targeted brownfields assessments for evaluating properties up front. There's other grants out there of other agencies and feel free to contact your TAB contractor such as CClear. And one thing to keep in mind as you move forward with these sites, the project champions. You really need a champion with the local government. You need a champion in any, any hurdles out there. The more you have in your corner, the better. So just, Keep an eye on that and look for people that are going to help you out. And always uh, begin with the end in mind. Getting a brewery in place. Thank you. Thanks, Mead. And uh, Sarah with New Belgium, why don't you take it away? All right. Thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Sarah Frazier. I work in sustainability here at New Belgium, and I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to share the story of our site. Um, first, a quick background on who we are and where we're coming from. New Belgium was founded in 1991 in Fort Collins, Colorado, in our co-founder's basement. Uh, we're now selling beer in all 50 states and currently number about 720 coworkers. There's a saying around here that we were born on a bike seat, like that image suggests. Um, our coworker, our co-founder, I should say, Jeff, was an electrical engineer by trade. He happened to also be a home brewer who was passionate about Belgian style ales in particular. And while he was traveling to Europe on business, he decided to bring his bike with him and pedal around Belgium, visiting abbeys and breweries and pubs and just basically soaking up Belgian beer culture. When he came back home, he put what he learned into practice um, and met Kim, our other co-founder, and a few years later, they quit their day jobs and made this a full-time gig. Um, the two were very intentional about what they wanted to create and founded the company on four core values and beliefs. One of those was environmental stewardship, and um, this commitment and ethic, as we say, honoring Mother Nature at every turn of the business, I think really led us to make the investment in this project and really develop a sensitive and sustainable design for our Asheville site. Next slide, please. So in 2009, we realized the need for a second brewery and began the search for a new location with over 33 different criteria. We are a 100% employee owned company and while our leadership team developed the list of criteria, our coworkers had the opportunity to vote on the importance of each of those items. And one of those criteria was to find a brownfield remediation or redevelopment opportunity. Next slide, please. You can see the concept for our brewery superimposed in the foreground of this aerial image. Um, and in addition to being a brownfield, the site we settled on in Asheville was appealing to New Belgium because it's urban setting uh, adjacent to the city's River Arts District and in close proximity to downtown in West Asheville allows our coworkers like me to walk, ride a bike, or take the bus to work. It also means we're just part of the community and it's easy for our neighbors to stop by on their way home from work and meet friends for a beer or a guest who are visiting Asheville to just get here rather easily. Uh, we're, our property is about 18 acres and um, we're located on the west bank of the French Broad River as you can see in the picture. Next slide. So this site, like many brownfields and many, many redevelopment opportunities, has a long history of use. Um, there were various businesses that thrived here over the years. In an earlier slide, you saw a picture of Maine Auto Parts, which was an auto salvage yard and repair shop that operated in the 1950s and 60s. Other businesses that occupied this site included include the Western North Carolina Livestock Market, 
um, an auction house that was operated by the Penland family, which is shown in some of these pictures. There's also a storage unit um, and a diner. And all this stuff was here when we purchased it. Next slide. So we purchased the site in 2012, and after performing phase one and phase two environmental site assessments, we did a lead-based paint and asbestos surveys. Uh, we entered into the Brownfields Agreement with the state Brownfields program. And those the surveys revealed that we had low levels of petroleum products left over from the auto repair and salvage operation. Uh, we also had small amounts of lead-based paint and lots and lots of debris um, discarded in an old construction demolition landfill that was situated where our tasting room now stands. So we uh, had an environmental site management plan developed and we got to work. And as we evaluated what to do with the contaminated soil, we made the decision to keep it on the property rather than trucking it off site. The closest place that would accept the soil was down in South Carolina and would not only have been a big expense, but also a large carbon footprint to truck that material all the way down there. And it just really didn't feel good for us to transfer the problem to someone else to deal with. Next slide, please. So much of the soil was moved to an area along Craven Street, which is the neighborhood road flanking our property. And it was graded into a berm and capped with two feet of clean soil. Uh, next slide, please. And we planted that berm with over 10,000 plugs of native plant species and dozens of native trees that are known for their phytoremediation capabilities. The area now provides habitat for birds and pollinators and other wildlife. Um, and we, we don't, we mow it once a year. And so it gets this kind of wild and woolly look, but we get a lot of compliments from the neighbors and it, it kind of provides a visual buffer of our truck court for the neighborhood and those traveling along Craven Street. Next slide, please. So all these old buildings on site, there were a ton of them. Um, it, we really wanted to reduce the quantity of waste that we sent to the landfill. So we carefully deconstructed those old buildings and warehoused them and then reused as much of that material as possible during construction. Next slide, please. We have over 14 linear miles of wood from the old livestock market that we've used as exterior siding on the brewery and the tasting room and have incorporated into the building's interiors as baseboards and even bathroom stalls. That picture in the lower right shows a small bar inside the brew house where you, um, it's also made with some of that old livestock market wood and you can even see some of the uh, cattle stall numbers um, on those beams that are framing the bar. Corrugated metal, some of it <laughs> covered in graffiti was used in the interior of the brewery and other metal and wood was crafted by local artists into tables and chairs. We even took the old, sign, the old sign off the livestock market and repaired those letters and covered them with historic photographs that we found showing our site over the last, I don't know, about 100 years or so. And what we didn't reuse, we tried to recycle or give away, and we estimate a 97% diversion rate from the landfill. Next slide, please. So in addition to addressing the contaminated soil, um, we also undertook a stream restoration project on the ground in partnership with the city of Asheville and a local nonprofit called Riverlink. This stream bisects our property on its way to the French Broad River and was essentially a deep ditch just filled with debris and chunks of concrete, tires, washing machines, you name it. Um, and also the stream banks were collapsing on both sides and contributing sediment to the river. We had grant funding with the, from the State Clean Water Management Trust Fund and were able to stabilize the stream banks and restore ecological function to this waterway. And then added a whole suite of native plants to this riparian corridor. And it's now become a focal point for our campus as well as providing important habitat for wildlife and birds and pollinators in this urban area. Um, it certainly, as you can imagine, had an impact on the whole construction of the site, having to deal with this thing that bisects the property. Um, certainly some impacts to construction sequencing as well as the, just the complication of getting equipment down in there to work on the stream. Next slide, please. We named this creek uh, Penland Creek in honor of the Penland family that came before us on this property and operated that auction house. 
And here's some more recent pictures of this creek. It's just really become a beautiful focal point um, on the property. And it's although it's a really short stretch through our property, it's just it's just nice to see and um, something that we can stop on the bridge and talk about during brewery tours. You can see in that right hand photo um, a culvert way at the top. It's a bottomless arch culvert where it passes under the parking area, and and that was a key choice. Um, that natural bottom mimics a stream more naturally than a closed pipe would be and prefers a much better aquatic habitat for insects and amphibians and, and fish. Next slide, please. Our site design partner, Equinox Environmental, created a stormwater management design that mimics uh, a natural ecosystem in treating stormwater as it passes through our property on its way to the French Broad River. The bioswales pictured in the upper photographs here are in our parking areas. And these elements dissipate the energy of water to reduce scouring and erosion as water flows into a, uh, eventually into a bioretention basin. And then a constructed wetland located on the north end of our campus is heavily planted with some native plants. And it has a variety of deep and shallow pools that also promote habitat for amphibians and insects, and even a family of ducks, as you can see there, um, all while filtering stormwater. Next slide, please. Our partnership with the city also included some transportation improvements to Craven Street. Uh, as the city realigned and widened this road, they added bike lanes on both sides and sidewalks and on-street parking, making it Asheville's first complete street, uh, which is a designation by the state DOT that accommodates multiple users, not just vehicles. And as the city's first green street, another designation, um, it manages and treats stormwater with porous pavers in those parking areas and these pocket-sized bioretention cells that you can see here. In the upper photograph, you can see one during construction, and the cells are filled with an engineered soil, uh, soil media to a depth of about three and a half feet, which directly correlates to how much water can be stored and treated. And due to the brownfield nature of our property, we weren't able to infiltrate the water in these concentrated areas back into the ground, but instead the cells were lined with impervious liners and planted with native trees and other vegetation. Next slide, please. With a land donation from New Belgium, the city also invested in building a greenway along the length of our property parallel to the river. The total length of this section is about a half mile from the newly constructed trailhead um, that has bicycle and vehicle parking on the north end of our property to a newly constructed bus shelter um, that was also built with some reclaimed materials from our property on the south side. And in the next year or so, this section will connect with other existing greenways just south of us to create the county's longest stretch of greenway at five miles. Next slide. And I'm just gonna wrap it up here and say, um, come visit us in Asheville and come see it in person and, and drink a beer and I'll pass it along. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And actually, if anybody is interested in learning more about that project, uh, Sarah and I wrote a blog together about, about that project. So uh, please reach out to either one of us if you'd like to read it or uh, hear more about it. And uh, so thank you, Sarah. And Dave, you're up. All right. Uh, my name is Dave McCormick. I'm the president of Waukesha Development. We're based in Petersburg, Virginia, but we work all over the state. And typically, uh, my company invests in really challenged communities, small communities around the state of Virginia, typically places that don't really get attention from typical, you know, market rate developers. So we're in, if you're familiar, familiar with Virginia at all, we're in little places like Bedford, Clarksville, um, uh, Cape Charles, you know, some um, uh, coastal communities, places like that. And we typically, um, one of our, the cores of our uh, business is really using state and federal historic tax credits, but we also get into all sorts of other grants and programs, um, and Brownfields Grants is one of them. We've done about, this slide slightly, I think we're, we're approaching about $100 million in investment throughout state right now and um let's see next slide 
Um, we, you know, typical issues we have building and site conditions are less than ideal. You know, it's great to build something new on a site, but we're typically refurbishing old um, buildings. Uh, everything we do more or less is adaptive reuse in some way. And the challenges are always asbestos, lead, buried tanks, um, some site contamination, and then of course, always dealing with uh, complicated zoning issues, parking, you know, um, what we tax credits are sometimes automatically available if something's on the state uh, register, but sometimes we have to put things on the register. And there's many challenges around financing something in a place that isn't perceived to have a market or by the banks uh, or they, you know, banks or appraisers just don't understand it and have a real hard time valuing something. That is where we specialize. Next slide. So a good example of that is the town of Petersburg, Virginia. It's about 20 minutes south of Richmond. And Petersburg historically has just been beat up and knocked around for you know 200 years. And uh, it's no different today. This is an old ice and coal plant that's really was abused over the years. And um, I think pretty much was either going to collapse or get bulldozed one or the other. Um, I actually bought this from a private individual who had the intent of saving it, kind of loved it to death at the end there. Um, next slide. It's an old ice and coal plant. It looked like this when we found it. And it, this actually looks in better shape than it really was. As we go through the next slides, you can see what I mean uh, by that. At, um, back in the in this days, I didn't. Even, this was just as recent as you know, oh four oh five when I purchased the property. Didn't really even realize what a brownfield site was or what brownfields meant, but realized this was a great candidate for something like that. And and this is you know fairly typical of the condition that we find these buildings in. This had um, an ammonia system of making ice. I don't know the science behind all that really, but there's always uh, worry over all the tanks and pipes and any kind of residual thing that's still in the building aside from any asbestos um, issues this one actually had cork and mastic that um, had all collapsed off the walls and got intermingled on the site so it was just a, a giant mess next slide uh, here's just a sense of the deterioration keep, keep clicking through these slides you can see how bad this building really was. We, it was so bad and so collapsed, we actually got into it using a bulldozer going right through the wall. Because it was, uh, you, you couldn't get inside of it. It was that dangerous. So we had ended up having to float this entire building. You get a sense of the scale of this thing. It was just monumental, but floated the entire building and um, did those repairs kind of from the outside in. This one happened to have zero lot lines on that side. And then through the spring and summer, finally got this thing stable and started to build it out. So this was a $6 million project. Here you can see it starting to wrap up. We got our silo in. And, um, you know, we, we actually were able to uh, get this funded because um, typically when we do market rate projects, that's a pretty easy thing to finance. But the bankers got very excited about the success of breweries. And we we're able to tell that story even in a really challenged market. We didn't, you know, as, as investors, you know, you hope for the best. We created a pro forma around all this, but didn't really know what to expect. Um, if you go to the next slide, you can see how this um, thing started to finish out. This is a 30 barrel production facility. It was our goal not just to have sell beer over the bar, but actually put beer into distribution, which is a, a, really a whole nother business model. Um, but we wanted to you know, put this thing on the map and create a beer brand in Virginia that was really strong for uh, real estate developers, but also entrepreneurs. That same area where you saw it all collapse, this is that angle looking in at the brew house. And then we'll come to the slide where you see the finished project from the outside. Um, that's it today. Um, this was a, a massive transformation of this building, but also of the neighborhood. And it's very interesting, you know, as a result, we're two years old now. I had seen really almost no institutional or outside investment in Petersburg before this was done. It was all kind of like local, you know, real, um, I would call speculative um, investment. And uh, for the first time, we just saw 
uh, coincidentally, on, on my building or up the road, uh, a sale to a, um, a bigger institutional firm that's come down and started um, buying some of this property up because of the transformation. So since we've opened 42,000 pizzas served, that even surprised me when I looked on Square and figured that out. 113,000 beers poured, 22,000 customers. This thing is way more successful than we could even imagine. And we are, we're now a top 15 uh, brand in the Richmond market. And that's of all brands in the country. So we're very, very proud of this one. But it just really does kind of um, show how transformative a brewery can be in a town that people really almost ha had kind of given up hope on. So next slide, let's see. So just to review that $6 million project, um, by the time we got the grants and the tax credits into this thing, we settled out around two and a quarter million, uh, or so I had, there's a, there's a multifamily part of this project. So you have to, um, and there's a, I would say, so the combined total might be around three, seven by the time we're done in terms of full, you know, multi-stage permanent financing. 30,000 barrel capacity. We did create 25 jobs here, some of whom live in the in the building now, in the multifamily side, and opened in June of 2016. So we're we uh, are coming up on our two year anniversary. Next slide. Um, just to give you a sense, this the, all these incentives weren't necessarily applied to this project, but um, we do use state and federal historic tax credits and try to go for as many grants as we can. And the the uh, Brownfield grant is a real key one in terms of uh, the exploratory work we have to do, taking tanks out of the ground and just getting the bank to a point where they can actually close on the property. That's a, it's a kind of a sketchy thing for us, you know, in a, in a small town to go out on a limb with into some of the unknowns, but it's to have the DEQ Brownfield grant behind us, it uh, really helps us get to the closing table. Next slide. Um, this is a little bit more about the challenges. I've mentioned the unknowns, government um, red tape, and I mean that kind of you know locally. There's a, a lot of uh, towns and municipalities that could be unfamiliar with these challenges as they uh, uh, the, when developers come in for the first time. And then there's also this the perception issue about unproven markets, small towns. How you overcome those things is just a very challenging thing that you kind of chip at little by little. And then um, at the end of this slide, I show this thing, you know, just talking about the exit. A lot of people think I mean, what I mean there is the sale, but really I mean the conversion to permanent financing and trying to uh, massage this thing on a balance sheet so that we could keep developing property and not have it lard up the balance sheet. So it's, it's difficult to find sometimes non or partial recourse permanent financing that helps us do that. Next slide. Um, so just to give you a sense of some other projects here, this is another brewery we did out in Bedford. A lot of the same things. We brought in a, a, some state grants on this, but this here again, this was an old power plant used by a rubber manufacturer in the small town of Bedford, Virginia. Population of this town is about 6,600 people. Next slide. Uh, just some um, the existing conditions on the inside. Lots of asbestos on the uh, old pipes and, and things. And, a lot of ivy growing up in the building. Here it is today. This was a $3.2 million project. Um, we bought that permanent financing down about a, a million and a half, 40 jobs, created a real big tax revenue um, for the town and the county itself and brought a lot of tourism in um, into the small town. That's really our goal for some of these, it's just to not just create something for the community, but to create a tourism opportunity for the community and draw people in. And then um, they'll then use other businesses, services, um, consume hotel rooms and things like that. Next slide. Um, we opened June 17th. So this is a year after we opened Trapezium, almost to the, to the weekend. And um, this one is having just really uh, great success. We had 2,000 people come through here on the first day. There's only 6,000 people in town. So you could see how much we had drawn from other areas into this place. And one of my greatest successes about this project was there was a couple of old timers that owned the building next door. And I remember the day one of them spit on the ground and said, this ain't ever going to work. And when 
you know, 2,000 people come through the door on day one. I, there's no greater payoff than proving people like that wrong. Next slide. So just some more slides of the opening. Next slide. Um, and now we're, this is the third brewery. This is in a town of Amherst, Virginia, in an old flour mill. Um, this is, again, a tiny little town about 15 miles north of Lynchburg, Virginia. Our goal here was to create uh, an economic development opportunity for the county and a good business for us. So we really had to get creative about how we treated this building. Next slide. This is an old, um, uh, it was powered by a water wheel. Our goal here is um, where a lot of old timers, again, might think this business, is, this building is obsolete, the business is obsolete. We're looking at this property from the point of view of, a, of brewing and saying, could we turn that water wheel into a hydropower generation um, situation there and use the water to power the, the building? Um, could we use the land to grow ingredients for the beer? Again, lots of massive structural problems here. Some were frightening. They were, we really started pulling things apart. Just the condition of this building was awful. Buried tanks, again, you know, asbestos, um, oddball wells dug all over the place, um, and, you know, really massive structural problems. And we're, uh, so we're, we had to immediately race in and start fixing this to, to keep this building from falling over. Next slide. And so that, that's it for me. Um, you know, there are, uh, again, we'll be open in this brewery here, June of July of 18. So we're on track to do uh, three for three in terms of the years uh, going by here. And we're really excited about that. Great. Thank you, Dave. Uh, Steve? Okay. Hi. Hey, this is Steve Gill with the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality. I'm the Brownfields and VCP specialist in the northern portion of the state. And today I'm going to talk about um, brew fields in Idaho. Next. So this is a great craft brewery map of the United States. You can probably see a number of breweries embedded in different states. Idaho has a big golden lab, and you can see its tongue coming out for Laughing Dog Brewing Company, and uh, there's the state of Idaho. So I'm quite a bit west of uh, everyone else on today's call. Next. So Idaho's Brownfields program began in about 2004, and since then we've helped lots of communities and owners of different properties from site assessments to risk evaluations to cleanup planning and, and cleanups. This particular site in this photo is in the town of Moscow, Idaho. And actually, our Brownfields program was never involved with this because the city of Moscow had their own Brownfields Coalition grant that they put together. And they went ahead and completed phase ones and phase twos and risk evaluations. And next slide. The property was sold, and a developer today is putting a $24 million project Moscow is also the home of the University of Idaho, so you have lots of needs for uh, student housing. And this will have 392 beds in it. And uh, they rolled into our voluntary cleanup program to go ahead and complete the brownfield. So this was a great collaborative um, effort between a city that had their own Brownfields Coalition grant and the state. Next slide. So Idaho is a uh, Small, small state population-wise, about a million and a half people, but a great state for beauty, mountains, trees, and water. But because of that, next slide, about 125 years ago, we saw a lot of influx of uh, natural resource extraction industries, whether it was mines, mills, or even agriculture, that changed the scenery of the, the state itself. And, those are Brownfields projects, and we're working on a lot of those. But today, we're talking about brew fields. So let's go to the next slide. Next. Yep. OK, thanks. So this is small town Idaho. Uh, this is actually Sandpoint, Idaho, in about 1965. I was a little boy growing up at the time. The neat thing about those natural resource 
industries that came into Idaho back in the day is that they also produced small towns. Most of the towns were 4,000 to about 14,000 people in population, but they had about everything you ever needed. And one of the things that's funny is as a kid growing up, my dad used to always say that there's a church, gas station, or a bar on every other corner. And that's really key for brewfields in Idaho. Next slide. Now, we have lots of churches still in Idaho. I don't have any yet that are brew fields. However, um, in December, when we went to the national conference back in Pittsburgh, I did go to Church Brew Works, and I was very impressed. And uh, they have great pierogies and really good IPAs, so I would encourage you if you get back to Pittsburgh. But in Idaho, next, we do have lots of gas stations. And gas stations make great locations for brew fields. The neat thing about a gas station is it's always on the corner and it's usually in a high visible corner. We still have lots of bars and um, one of the days some of the folks will learn how to spell tavern but that's a, actually an existing bar that's still in the town of Sandpoint. Next. So one of the things I wanted to kind of cover too is the you know the what the U.S. beer sales are and, and what the craft brew impact is. And so while overall beer sales for the year 2017 were down 1.2%, craft brew sales were up by 5%, and craft brew exports were up by 3.6%. Now this is a huge market, and when we consider brownfields, and you're looking for folks to come in and, and look at properties, this is one of a, a great market. I mean, it's a $111 billion market in the United States. Craft brews alone are $26 billion. So as their share grows, this is an important statistics to remember. And all of this is available off the Brewers Association website. Next. Now, you might wonder about Idaho. So million and a half people, these statistics are from 2016. We had about 53 craft breweries. I think we're up to about 70 now. We're a, a, a fairly uh, rural state, um, pretty conservative, but we have state statute that discusses beer is 31 pages long. I was really surprised. I, I think it has more than some of our environmental programs. But our license fees are really reasonable. If you're brewing less than 10,000 gallons a year, you, you start at 50 bucks to license. And if you're making more than 930,000 gallons a year, it's $500. So those are fairly reasonable rates that, that craft brewers can get into without a lot of excessive license fees. And to me, another simple thing about a state like Idaho is we don't have a lot of complexity in our excise tax. If you have a beer that's less than 4% alcohol, it's 15 cents a gallon. If it's greater than 4%, it's 45 cents a gallon. And that's kind of a good good number to remember because your really good craft brew that might run 6 to 11% alcohol, it's paying the same excise tax as somebody who's ordering a Bud Light or a Coors Light. So those are, that's the, it levels a playing field there even at the bar from the retail standpoint. Next. So because of this, we're seeing lots of brew fields in Idaho with lots of unique and fun names and great logos because I think the people who invest in, in, in breweries themselves, um, they're, um, they're very entrepreneurial, energetic, and dynamic individuals. And so this slide just kind of gives you an idea of the nature of that in the state of Idaho. And so now I'm going to talk about three separate brewfield projects. Next. So Boise is our state capital in the southern portion of the state, and is probably where the most amount of breweries are. This particular project or site here, in 1903, it was first developed. Again, we're a young state, so 1903 wasn't that long ago. The property um, eventually became a gas station, a shell gas station, in the 40s and into the 70s. And um, next slide. The great thing about gas stations, as I said earlier, it's um, they're always on valuable downtown corners. They're, they're sitting right there, and 
in the best location because the major companies generally were the ones who initially brought in these gas stations in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and uh, they wanted something highly visible that their competitor down the street maybe didn't have as good of an advantage. So this particular area of Boise was growing. We're seeing a lot of uh, uh, professional firms move into this district that had some warehouses and stuff, and you saw a whole dynamic and change. And by the year 2010, there were a lot of uncertainties to do with this business, and it just kind of set their language, blighted which blighted is always a, a word that you see a lot when you talk about brownfields and you do any research on it. Next. Next slide. Thank you. So um, all of a sudden, this site in 2010 started to get a lot of activity. And so the city of Boise and their urban renewal district, they uh, came up with a master plan for the whole area and it included this property. And then from a combination of funding, both CCDC and Idaho DEQ committed Brownfields funding and a couple phase ones, phase twos, some risk evaluation was done and we cleared this property to go ahead and be redeveloped without extensive cleanup. And so it didn't cost much to get it to that point to where the lenders would look at it. Next. So we had a group of individuals partners that were looking for a beer bar and growler fill station and using just craft brews. Now, while they're not brewing beer here, like in, in the nature of a true brewery, especially some of the stuff that Dave was just talking about, and, and just going back to Dave's slides for a minute, the great thing about, about any uh, uh, brewery slides you ever notice that when they show the groups of people, everybody's smiling, so that's, that's good. That's, it's a happy kind of uh, uh, portion of the Brownfield site. But this brewery is, is now expanding into neighboring towns outside of Boise, and it's doing really well. So it was, again, a, a great uh, property to go ahead and look for a brew field. Next slide. So now we're going to go 500 miles north of Boise to the tip of the state up by the Canadian border, and there's a little town called Sandpoint. Sandpoint is, uh, sits right on the edge of Lake Pend Oreille. Uh, the largest lake in the state of Idaho, and it's right at the base of Schweitzer Ski Resort and one of the bigger ski resorts in the state of Idaho. And recently, just uh, January of 2018, Where to Retire magazine went ahead and they named their top retirement destinations. And they had a lot of discussion in there in the small print, but the real thing is the big print. Craft breweries attract people downtown. Sandpoint has a number of craft breweries, and that's why it was named one of the top retirement destinations. Next slide. So one of these brew fields in Sandpoint was three different properties. They were owned by the Avidel family. And initially, uh, the first property was um, developed in 1908, and it was the first blacksmith shop in the city of Sandpoint. And then there were a couple other pro properties associated with this. Uh, Dodge Automobile Dealership in 1921, LeGru and Sons. And then in 1946, a small tavern, City Club Tavern. So these three properties sat there for many years in that sort of existence. Uh, the picture there is February 1948 of the directory of the city of Sandpoint. And both City Machine Shop, which was a blacksmith shop, and LeGru and Sons were still in business. Next slide. So let's fast forward to 2006. So the old city blacksmith shop, the white building on the top, the top photo, it had been operating as a minute lube, lightning lube it was called, and for about 20 years. So about 1986, they started the lightning lube business. And the old LaGrue auto dealership became Alpine Ski Shop because Schweitzer Ski Resort was there. So. The old city tavern had been torn down and was just an empty lot that at that time, the um, Alpine shop, they also sold boats and they needed a place to store boats, so they were using that lot. In 2006, as the real estate market was really peaking, Mr. Avidal had a um, prospective purchaser who was really interested in buying his properties, all three of them, and they had plans for redevelopment. 
So they went ahead and they had a phase one, not through our Brownfields program, but just independently. They did a phase one and a limited phase two, and they came back with suspected um, recognizable environmental co conditions that were associated with the lightning loop business. And so Mr. Avidal was looking for a way to potentially either clean up this property or to, to move this forward, and he approached Idaho DEQ. And at that time, our voluntary cleanup program also had a funded um, community reinvestment pilot initiative program. We called it the pilot. And it allocated up to $150,000 per property for cleanup um, you know, after, after the assessment work was done. So in late 2007, Mr. Avidal was ready to uh, roll into the uh, voluntary cleanup program and go forward with this. And as it happened to many folks with properties in that year, or the next year, 2008, as the market crashed, the prospective purchaser pulled out of the agreement, and Mr. Avidal was set holding his businesses. Now there were nothing. There was nothing in the um, phase one that the uh, private consultant did that was uh, urgency as far as you know protecting human health and the environment. So this property just kind of plugged along. Next slide. So in 2016, all of a sudden we were alerted by the city of Sandpoint that new buyers were again looking at the Avidale properties. In the picture there, uh, that's Brent and Nicole Ekrit and they were interested in purchasing the property. In fact, the, the, the Alpine Ski Shop, when they pulled the uh, false front off the building, they found that it had also been a, a marina and a, a Yamaha motorcycle dealership and a home light chainsaw dealership at one time. This happens to old buildings and towns. We're all familiar with it. So the city of Sandpoint requested that we complete a phase one to see how these properties look today. Idaho DEQ went ahead and had our contractor complete uh, phase one on the three properties. The Lightning Lube had cleaned up their act a lot. Most of the wrecks that were before were all concerned with housekeeping and the Lightning Lube business, drains, things like this, uncertainties. So this time the phase one came back and uh, there were no recognizable environmental conditions that would have stopped the redevelopment of these businesses. And so with a simple phase one through our Brownfields program, the transaction occurred and Brent and Nicole purchased this property. Next slide. So the following year in 2017, Brent and Nicole were, were in Sandpoint and they met David Koshiba and Christine Stetcher and they worked a deal to, to uh, take the old lightning lube the 1908 blacksmith shop and convert it into Utera Brewing Company. And so we're seeing that happen now. I was just up at the site last week and they're finishing their, their back patio and, and the back area and they're remodeling the inside of the, the old blacksmith shop and it surprisingly has great bones. It's going to be a, a, a neat um, operation. And uh, kind of the coolest thing is it's uh, Utera it's a British style brew pub and uh, they're going to have, of course, great craft brews and uh, paired with fast, casual Anglo-Indian cuisine. And I thought that was something that I'd probably never say about uh, Brownfield's project, but I, I, I like it. So there you go. So one more. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the last project I'm going to talk about is what I originally talked about when Mead and I did a presentation in Chicago in 2015, and it was Laughing Dog Brewing Company. So this picture here is, was taken in 1908. Northern Pacific Railroad, of course, uh, we would have never seen natural resource extraction industries come through without the railroads. And Sandpoint was a, was a, a bottleneck of railroads. It had three main railroads coming through. In fact, to this day, there's 77 trains that pass through that town every day. 1908 in the city of Kootenai, and Kootenai is just located two miles away from the city of Sandpoint. Uh, Northern Pacific built a, a roundhouse and, and, and a big rail car shop. And the rail car shop worked on about 1,200 rail cars a month. 
So some uncertainty, big structure, lots of work, lots of things happen there. Next slide. So about 100 years later, in 2008, a project began, the Pondre Bay Trail Project, and we ended up with a $650,000 Brownfields Coalition grant. And it helped us look at these properties to uh, clear them. That's located between the city of Sandpoint and the city of Kootenai, about two and a half miles of shoreline along this industrial railroad corridor. In 2015, one of the properties in Kootenai where the rail car shop was sold, and it was sold to a company that was going to call Patrick Properties, and Patrick Properties was, was going ahead and they're going to build Laughing Dog's new 30,000 barrel a year brewery on this site. So we started down the path with an updated phase one and a phase two. And when we completed everything, we found that the, the really uh, out of the eight acre site, there was only about a quarter of an acre that had any real impacts that would prevent all uses, including residential. So it was a pretty darn clean site. Next to the that particular site, the Bonner County Historical Society owns the next chunk, and they're looking to expand the existing museum out to there. But as things often happen, pressure on the market, Laughing Dog had to expand quicker than they had anticipated. And so, next slide. They went ahead and, and about a mile away in the city of Pondere, Idaho. So these communities are located really close to each other. They went ahead and built their newest brewery and their canning facility, and that's operating. They still own the other, Patrick Property still owns the other property, and it's going to be used for either future expansion of Laughing Dog or a mixed-use residential. So it still is a, a great brew field, and uh, timing is everything on all these projects. So as we all know, and, and as markets are uh, increasing again, almost like they were prior to the 2008 issue. Uh, we're seeing a lot of pressure to move things sometimes faster than we can even accomplish through our programs. But the great thing is, next slide, is that you can always enjoy one of the beverage that these folks make and any of these folks that we've talked about today. So whether it's New Belgian or, or some of the sites that Mead talked about or some of the sites that Dave talked about, um, it's it's kind of exciting to be part of Brewfields. I've got a couple others here in the state that we are looking at and going for, and so I thank you very much. All right, thank you, Steve. And uh, we will take questions now. So I see a few have trickled in, uh, so feel free to start typing any questions for our speakers. And uh, yeah, thank you, Mead, Sarah, Dave, and Steve. Uh, this has been very illustrative of, of really how catalyzing breweries can be in larger cities, smaller towns, and all across the U.S. Um, everybody or most people like beer, so it's, it's been interesting to learn about these. So Dave, I have a question for you that's come in. Um, and the question is um, regarding trapezium brewing. Um, was this, did you have a tenant in mind before you started building or did you, uh, how did you solicit uh, a potential tenant? Well, you know, when it's interesting because when we're in, in small communities, but also distressed communities, it's really hard to find, uh, maybe even sometimes impossible to find a tenant that's really well capitalized with strong brand sensibilities to come in and do make an investment like this. So um, we did, um, I did a lot of networking with people in the business, but um, at the end of the day, you know, I, I, you know, I do real estate projects, but I also am someone myself who's got, I, I think pretty high standards around branding and things like that. So I just felt like, if we're really going to do it right in this particular set, just needed to do it ourselves. Um, I had been through that experience once before with a coffee shop where I just I didn't feel comfortable um, with the tenant pool that was out there. So we did our own project, and and you know that may sound controlling or egotistical or whatever, but we just knew we it needed to work. It needed to to not fail. 
you know, it needed to be really uh, kind of um, high quality. So I just felt like we could control that process the most. So at the end of the day, I went out into the Virginia, you know, community of brewers and um, just tried to find some top talent. And then I created the business. Ah, okay. So we lease from ourselves, basically, you know, not an entity structure, married entity structure. Mm -hmm. So we are getting a couple different questions that are essentially asking similar things. So for any of the speakers, what is the strategy for recruiting brewers to your area? I, I, I could probably answer that, you know, it, um, mm -hmm. from my perspective, from the developer's perspective, it's just really important to kind of get embedded in that community. It's uh, amazing when you're on the outside looking in, it's hard to know what's even going on or who's out there and who's doing what. But there's an amazing community once you penetrate that and see who's out there doing things. And I think it's, it's really a word of mouth. There's a lot of chatter out there on different, um, uh, uh, what do you call it? like sites, blog sites and um um, industry sites where people are always talking, but the most important thing is to go to some of the, um, the conventions. So like the CBC, which is the craft brewers convention, that is just a key thing to attend and start meeting people and networking. There's also conventions on the state level, and then there's going to breweries themselves and just talking to people and meeting people and going to all the events that are out there. But it, it, it all be, it all snaps into focus once you do that. And Dave, another quick question: Do you do any projects outside of Virginia? Um, I do. I, I actually doing a huge project down in North Carolina, um, which is called the Whirly Gig Station Project. It's all um, based around a folk artist named Wallace Simpson. We're doing a multifamily, a restaurant. In the visitor center, I'm looking at projects in West Virginia right now, and um, and then we're also we are looking outside uh, of that footprint too. I, you know, for the most part, I've been chasing historic tax credits and ones that are actually don't have a limiting cap uh, or you know too small of a threshold. So, for instance, you know, Virginia, I mean, West Virginia tax credits are only 10 percent. Some states like Florida don't even have state taxes, so there, there's no eligibility there. So we're just we're trying to cr uh, create get get a situation together where the incentives actually create enough equity that we can leverage into doing the project. So, you know, if there's no state tax credits, there might be other uh, incentives. I will frankly look anywhere, and we always try to find uh, and you know put put a, a creative spin or try to find the upside to properties no matter where they are. So I, I will look at anything. We actually been talking about a project um, in Florida and um, looking at Ohio a little bit. So we're, our eyes and ears are open. Great. And a uh, question for Stephen Mead. Uh, how do you guys see these brewery projects improving the rural and urban connections in, in your areas, in Idaho and Virginia? Um, well, I'll take this first, Mead. In, in, in Idaho, in, in most of the communities we're looking at where we're seeing brew fields, there's already a, a, a push to see some redevelopment, and yet we have these, these properties that are sitting there that a lot of times have so many uncertainties. So a state program can come in and, and kind of clear them up for the lenders and it, and it really works. I think that um, we have properties in, in almost every community in the state of Idaho that are, are really one of the, the three tenants I said. It's uh, you know, the, the idea of the church bar or gas station on every corner. So we have those issues that, that are out there and, and uh, I think we can help address them. Mead? Yeah, I, I can echo what Steve has said. And, you know, so many of these small towns in a way had died. And, uh, you know, the, the railroad stopped stopping at them. The country stores went out of business. The post office is still there. 
But, you know, there, there really needed to be some type of focal point to the community. And there weren't good restaurants and there weren't breweries, of course. And being able to, to help out and whether you're, you've got some Brownfields money that's an EPA grant, whether there's some state funds, uh, and, and sometimes there really has to be some out of the box thinking and hopes and, and to do some phase ones. And as much as I hate to do phase ones and phase twos that might get put on the shelf, if you can do that and help people get the start, eliminate some of the unknowns, give some support, uh, some Brownfields individualized outreach. If you can get a brewery or a restaurant going, it can really make the difference. And, and I know with Dave, that demolition coffee was a big toehold to make and change in Petersburg itself. And we've seen it in some really small rural towns that we had less to do with, uh, such as St. Paul, Virginia, which now has a little brewery and, and a uh, restaurant and a hotel. Uh, there are some other communities that we're working more closely with to get these type of things going. Great. And uh, I think we can end it here. If anyone has some last minute questions, feel free to type those in. But uh, thanks again to our speakers for calling in from all corners of the of the state. And uh, Steve, I think I have you beat on the uh, on the western front out in Oakland. But uh, yeah, thanks again to everyone who, who, who dialed in and uh, listened to the presentation. Um, anyone who, who has questions, I'll, I'll send it to the speakers afterwards. And uh, feel free to get in touch. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.